This episode of Brains on Games is about an area control war game with bag building. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald and this episode we're going to talk about a game that involves area control and bag building mechanics. It's a medieval themed war game that's a little bit like chess and I love those kinds of chess adjacent games you might call them the duke is is an example of a game like that and i think the duke was the very first video on this channel after my initial introduction but the game that we're going to talk about today is a game called war chess that just had an expansion released here's the big box of war chess it's a game that works well the instructions say age 14 and up but i think a 12 year old or 11 year old could understand this game if they're familiar with strategy games especially they might not be the best players at the table but certainly i think they could get the 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 gist of it uh, you can play a game in 30 minutes to an hour and you can play with two players or four players. So you can have two teams of two each, uh, which is another reason why it's kind of a fun way to bring sort of chess elements to the table and you can have more than two players. Now this neoprene mat is not the same board that came with the game. The game comes with a cardboard game board that's typical of most board games that unfolds, but uh, I prefer the neoprene one because it keeps everything flat. This is a custom mouse pad that I had made. Uh, they, uh, they allowed me to print an image on it that, that I downloaded from Board Game Geek. The only difference between the mat and the actual game board is that these, these hexes on the board that have the green control point symbols on them, they've got a white outline around them that makes it easier to see them when there's pieces that are covering up the green symbols. Inside the box, in addition to the game board and the rules, are these four cloth bags that have symbols embroidered on them. There's two bags that have a raven and two with a wolf. That's so that if you're playing four players, each player is going to have one of these bags. Uh, and then you've got the game pieces. Now, <laughs> the box has this magnetic clasp that I really like. I think that magnets make everything a little bit cooler but it opens by lifting up the clasp and then the whole top unfolds. And if things haven't fallen apart too much from manhandling the box, you can see, whoops, inside there are all of these chips. So they are some pretty thick kind of weighty chips. They've got like a, a, a pattern on, on the back with the keyhole in it. And, and then you've got some symbol on the front and that's what's going to represent your units in the game. Now, we are going to talk about the base game of War Chest, and there are, there are two expansions, and, and the Siege expansion is the one that just recently came out, uh, and I pre-ordered it, and it finally came last week, so I was able to try it out over the course of the week. So we'll talk about all of those. We'll start, though, with just the base game, and you choose those initial units. I'm going to put the box out of the way here. You choose those initial units in one of two ways. You might just have a draft where you draw eight of those cards and lay them out on the table and then each player is going to choose there. And you're going to go back and forth choosing those units. Now, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm noticing as I dealt those out that I've got cards from the expansions are all together. So I've combined most of the pieces inside the main box the first way, like I said, is that each player will draft four of these units and you go back and forth choosing which ones that you, you want to play in the game. Or the alternative is that you can reenact a battle that's inspired by some real historical battle. And the rule books have the, the rule book. This is the base rule book. Uh, but each expansion also has some additional battle and, from history that's described. They describe the battle, the year it took place, the story of what was going on at the time, and they tell which units each player should use in order to reenact that battle from history. So it's kind of a neat way, maybe especially with the expansions, it's a neat way to try out, uh, well, you learn a little bit about some historical battle, but also you're, you're trying out a squad that's maybe already been chosen or balanced out by the designers because it's based on this uh, battle from history. Okay, so I've pulled out some units here. I tried to keep it sort of similar to the ones that, that I drew at the beginning, but these are only units that were in the base game of War Chest. Uh, you've got the symbol, like I said, in the corner, and then here's the number of chips that, 
that that uh, unit is going to have available to you in, in the game. So if one player has a crossbowman, marshal, pikeman, and scout, and the other player has these chips here, there's one other thing that each player will have. There's this coin, which is called the royal coin. And we'll talk about what those coins will do. Uh, each player, so you've got the raven coin, and you've got the wolf coin. The, the final coin that's going to be on the board is basically the first player token, or the initiative token, and that's going to show face up which player is going first. So you've got the raven on one side, and then you've got the wolf on the other side. Finally, in addition to the bags, each player is going to have six of these tokens that show that they're controlling one of these points on the board. The goal of the game, the way that you win, is either to eliminate the other player's unit or to control six of these spaces on the board that have this green symbol. Now, in the base game, these control point uh, dominance tokens, or whatever you want to call them, uh, were just perfectly round, so they'd fit exactly underneath your coin, and you couldn't really tell who was controlling that point, whether it was you or whether whether it was the other player. So these uh, hexagonal ones make it a lot easier to tell what's what, because you've got, oh, hang on, you're going to have either the silver color or the gold color underneath, and it's really easy to see that on the board uh, underneath these pieces. Here, I'll show you, so you can see the outline around it. And here we have it, the board is set up for a game. Each player is going to control two of these control points right at the beginning, so they've already taken over two of the spots that they need. They need to take four more from here in the center, and it is not a very big board. Uh, you've got the initiative coin that's here along the side of the board as well. What goes into your bag though, because it is a bag building game. So the area control elements are, you need to be able to control six of these points on the board, at the beginning of the game, you're going to have your royal coin that I showed you earlier and two each of the units that are on your side. So each player has completely different units, so it's neat because uh, it's totally asymmetric in the way that you play the game. You know, in, in chess, each player has exactly the same pieces that move and do exactly the same things, but with war chess, by definition, each player is going to have com a completely different set of units that they control. Each turn, what you're going to do, once you've shuffled up the bag a little bit, is pull three coins out of the bag, which I will do right now. Now, you don't let your opponent see what coins you've drawn, because there is some bluffing involved in this game, too. I have drawn these three, two crossbowmen and a pikeman. Uh, what can you do with these coins is the, is the next question. Well, there are things that can happen if you discard your coins face up, and different things that you can do if you discard them face down. Let's talk about each of those. What you can do with these coins if you discard them face up, well, you can play one onto the board uh, so that you're going to use, so, so that you can use it later. Uh, you can only deploy your troops onto a control point that you are in control of. So you've got two spots at the start of the game, and if both of those are filled up with units, then you can't deploy a new one. One other thing that's worth knowing about uh, in War Chest is that you can't have two stacks of the same unit. So you, you can't have a crossbowman on both sites. The only unit that's allowed to do that is the footman. And that's it, it says that specifically on the card, that you can deploy footmen separately. What else can I do with these face-up discards? Well, I can also bolster a unit that's already on the table and stack the chip on top of the first one. And that means if someone attacks this unit, uh, I'm going to lose one of the coins, but the unit is still going to stay on the board because I had two chips. So you only lose the top one unless the unit who's attacking you has some ability to take two of the chips off at the same time. I could also discard my crossbow, my second crossbowman to attack uh, a unit that's next to mine. Or, in the case of the crossbowmen, if, there ones that one, if there's a unit that's farther away, I can use the unit's tactic. So I can discard the crossbowman coin in order to use the ability that's listed on this card. And in this case, it says that I can attack a unit that's two hexes away. 
Uh, so I get a long, of course, the crossbowman would get a long distance attack, but you have to discard your coin face up. That is one of the things I think that's, that starts to get interesting about this game as you play through is that you're going to have this discard pile so your opponents are going to know, oh wait, you know, I only had two of these in the bag and I drew both of them. Now my crossbowman is stuck. There's nothing that crossbowman can do. So if this guy starts moving forward, he, he knows that he will not be attacked because I do not have another crossbowman in this bag. So you can see how many of the coins are left in the stack uh, and how many are discarded face up over here. Okay, so I can use that coin to use the tactic that that unit has if it has some sort of powerful ability or I can use it to do just a regular attack if there's a unit next to mine. I can also discard the coin face up to, whoops, <laughs> I can also discard the coin face up to move my unit so that it's closer or maybe farther away from the other units that might be trying to attack it. The final things that I can do by discarding a coin face up is to work on one of these control points. So if, there, if no one's in control of it and it's a neutral control point, I can discard my crossbowman in this case and now I have taken control of that hex. Now if instead I walked on here and there was a raven token instead of my wolf, I can discard my crossbowman to get rid of that control of that space. And, and uh, then in the next turn, if I'm able to draw another crossbowman coin, I could take it over as long as this unit is, is still around, uh, alive and kicking, so that it can still act. What about the face down discards? That's interesting too, because it certainly makes it harder for your opponent to know what's left in your bag if you start discarding things face down. You can discard a coin face down to seize the initiative. So if my opponent here, because I had the wolf facing up on the initiative coin, if my opponent discarded a coin face down, they could flip that over and then in a two player game, they're gonna get two turns in a row. Really helpful uh, as part of your strategy because they'll draw three more coins and get to do something different. You could also discard a coin face down to recruit some more units from the stack that you have in front of you. You begin the game with, well, many of the ones on my side at least have five. Uh, the pikeman only has four units, so maybe I want another crossbowman because I've only got two crossbow coins in the bag and one of them is already on the board, so maybe I want another one of those. Uh, or maybe I want to be able to be more flexible with some other unit in the bag. Obviously, when I recruit, it's going to increase the likelihood that I'm going to draw that unit on a later turn. But the unit comes from your supply and it goes to your discard pile face up. So you don't get access to that coin right away. You have to wait until your bag runs out and then you refill it. And then you'll have access again to all the coins that are here in front of you. When we're talking about face down discards, you can also pass. So you can recruit, you can seize the initiative, or you can just put a coin face down and pass that portion of your turn. It, you could put it down as the first action of, of your turn, or you could put it down later on, it doesn't matter. You're, you don't have to pass your full turn if you just put a coin down and pass it. Sometimes that happens later in the game. You may not want to move or bolster. You might want to save that coin for later. Uh, sometimes it happens if you've got the royal coin and you've already got the initiative. What are you going to do with the royal coin? It's only used for face down discard so you're either seizing initiative or recruiting and if at the later in the game you may not have any of these uh, units left in your supply to recruit so you might find yourself passing more often what we're talking about here i mean there's the spatial element like there's so much if you look at these cards i'm going to put one here uh let me put two actually out here where you can see hopefully you'll be able to see uh, at least the basics here, these two units. So with the crossbowman, you've got that tactic of being able to attack a unit that's two spaces away, so they don't have to be right next to you. And with the scout, the scout does not have to be deployed on a control point that you control. It can be deployed next to a friendly unit, so it can be sort of a surprise attack if uh, if 
you've got a couple of those coins in your hand, you might be able to deploy and attack in the same turn, but you only get three actions because you're only drawing three coins at a time. So you've got this spatial element and you're trying to predict what the other players might be able to do. Each player can see the other player's unit and, and they'll know what units they have access to. You'll know how many might be in the bag. So you're, you're doing some spatial analysis, spatial planning. It really is a lot of visual spatial reasoning that's involved in uh, planning your moves here, but also it's about your knowledge of probability. This is kind of a sneaky math operation that we're talking about here. With these bag building games, with deck building games, you are manipulating the probability of what actions you're going to have available as you fill up those bags. What I think is neat about this one is that there are only four different units that you're putting into the bag, plus you've got that royal coin that's kind of not really a wild card, but it can only be used to do certain things. Now, depending on what units are on, on the table when you're playing this game, you might be playing it sort of as a race, trying to spread out as fast as you can and get those six control points under your control, or it might be more of a war of attrition if you've got certain units that maybe are, are more resistant to attack or, or those long range units that, it, that can attack from a distance, that might mean that the players will have to be more cautious about where they move those units. So it is a game that I find really interesting uh, I know Tabletop Bellhop had some complaints about the design, the fact that it's hard once you've got pieces on the board to tell where the control points are or who's in control. But since he looked at the game, they've got these great big pieces. And of course, my board has the white outline, so it makes it a little easier for me to see and to play. So maybe that's one of the reasons why I like it better than he does. Okay, the first expansion for War Chest was nobility and what nobility added to the game well four new units an earl a herald a bishop and a bannerman i think i remembered those right uh, but they also added these these things called royal decrees that you can play in the game let me tell you what those are okay in the nobility expansion there are seven of these royal decree cards uh, and there are things like being able to move a friendly unit or recruit twice instead of once uh, or attack a friendly unit so you've got these extra options you shuffle these up and you deal out three so there's only going to be three available to you through the game and you can only use a royal decree once how do you use that? It's by discarding your royal coin face up. That allows you to put your royal seal on here. And now it shows that, okay, I'm going to use this reinforce action. But I've already used it. I can only use it once per game. So each player has three of these little tokens that they can use. But then it covers up their, the spot for the seal on the card so you know that you can't use it more than once in the game. So it's kind of a simple addition but it definitely complicates things uh, when it comes to predicting what your opponent might be able to do. You might see that oh they don't have any uh, they don't have any moves left. Uh, the only coins that they have with the crossbowmen are, have already been taken off the board but now all of a sudden they can move a unit uh, because they've got the royal decree available to them. The brand new expansion for War Chest is the Siege expansion, which, as its name uh, more than implies, is all about siege engines. So you've got a siege tower, a war wagon, a sapper, and a trebuchet here. The new units in the Siege expansion have very powerful abilities called Siege Tactics. Let me spread them out here. Uh, you'll at least be able to see the cards. And what these these tactics are very powerful, but in order for a unit to activate its siege tactic, it has to be bolstered, meaning you've got to have two of these chips stacked on top of one another and then pull another chip from the bag and discard it face up in order to use the ability. The trebuchet, for example, can attack a unit that's up to three spaces away and this board is so small and crowded, that's a pretty huge ability. So you really are going to want, as the opponent, to get in there as quickly as possible and take out even one of those chips so that they can't use that ability anymore. Now the trebuchet, they're very clear, it can only attack by using that tactic. So if it's not bolstered, if you get that chip off of there, it can't do anything. All of a sudden it's just a useless piece of wood on the board that just takes up space so that another player can't go onto that spot until they get rid of it. 
The sapper is an interesting one. So it also has a siege tactic. If it's bolstered, it can attack, it can move and then attack a fortification. We're going to talk about what fortifications are. But also when the sapper moves, the sapper can build a fortification. And the fortifications are white chips like this, so they're really easy to tell. Even if there's another unit stacked on top of it, it's pretty easy to see that there's a white chip underneath. They're the only white chips in the game. But a, an opposing player has to attack the fortification before they can attack the unit that's on the fortification. So you could start to build up some defenses. You know, these guys are digging ditches or, or moats or something or putting spike pits in the way so that the opposing team can't get through, right? That's the, the, the idea of what that ability is supposed to be doing. Uh, and you start the game with a few fortifications already on the board. You've got a fortification map card. There are several of these. You shuffle these up and draw one, and it's basically a picture of the game board, and it shows where those castles are going to be. One of these fortifications is always going to be on one of each player's starting spaces, and the other is going to be, you'll have two more in the middle of the board that you can take over, but of course, if one player has the sapper, that's gonna mean that you can build some additional ones. There are a limited number of these fortifications. You start with four on the board and there's only a total of seven in the box. When one gets destroyed, it goes back into the supply, but if there's none available for the sapper to put on the board, he, the sapper can't use that ability, so it takes that ability away if all of the fortifications are in use. But trust me, on this small board with pieces moving around, I, I don't imagine you're going to very often be uh, at a loss for these um, fortifications. And there you have it, War Chest and two expansions in a nutshell. This is a game where you're working with a limited number of units, but each player has totally different ones, so it's completely asymmetric. You're manipulating the probability of what coins you're going to draw from that bag. The pieces are high quality and weighty and fantastic. I really like the components for this game and even the boxes with the magnetic clasps. You're using those spatial planning skills, those visual spatial reasoning skills to determine where the pieces are going to move and where they might move on the next turn. You're using your knowledge of probability to determine you know, what, what options the other player is going to have available to them to inform your moves. So, Lots of things going on in your mind when you're playing this game. I think it's a great strategy game to, to play with your teenage child. If you have questions about War Chest or any of the games you see behind me, if you have comments or suggestions, you can leave them below this video or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go and the previous episodes are up there already. Brains on Games is the Twitter handle and the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.